If buffers are the foundation of our game, then shaders are the glue that hold the visuals together. Shaders are another key piece of technology in any game. They are small programs that are meant to run on the GPU in a massively parallel manner. This makes them very useful for doing things like processing vertex data, shading geometry, or computing in general. I think the best way for you to see what a shader is capable of is just to show you. What you see here are a few shader programs that will be your challenges. This first program transforms a geometric plane into different pictures. The next program shows how you can use keyboard input to transform vertices at runtime. The last program shows how you can turn a tessellated plane into procedural terrain all on the GPU. Now that we know what shaders are capable of, let's talk about where they fit into the graphics pipeline. Real quickly though, it looks like 95% of you are not subscribed. 95%. You know what to do. Anyways, in the second video of this series, we talked about the graphics pipeline. Several of the stages in this process involve shaders. We will talk about the two most common shader stages today, the vertex shader and the fragment shader. If we look at the graphics pipeline, we can see that the vertex shader runs first. The vertex shader is what programmers will typically use to transform geometry from 3D world space into normalized device coordinates. This series of calculations uses a projection matrix, a view matrix, and a transformation matrix. Like we talked about in the last episode, you will usually model a 3D object using local coordinates. Or in other words, you will model that 3D object centered around the origin. This is useful because it allows us to apply our first transformation to this object, transforming the coordinates into world space. When we want to work with multiple game objects in one big game world, it becomes useful to think about coordinates as if they existed in world space. You can define the units of your game however you want. For example, say you were developing a 2D game, and it was easy to think in units of pixels. You could define your world space to exist in pixel units, and the camera would always be able to see 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. These world units could be useful because they allow you to think about where your game objects will appear on the screen in pixels. However, you don't need to use 1920 by 1080 pixels. You can use whatever units you want. For example, say instead you wanted your 2D world to consist of meters, and you wanted your camera to be able to see 6 meters by 3 meters. You can do that as well. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is you are in control of what your game units represent. So, I would suggest that you come up with a system that you would like to use for your game. This could be pixels, meters, feet, or in our case, cubes since our world will consist of cubes. So, whenever I mention world units, I will be assuming that one unit is equal to the width, depth, or height of one cube. Okay, so we've settled on a world unit system. Now we need to transform our vertices from local coordinates into normalized device coordinates. We can do that using the transformation matrix, view matrix, and projection matrix. If you're unfamiliar with how linear algebra and matrices can be used to transform coordinates, I would recommend watching this video by 3Blue and Brown to gain a deeper understanding. First, let's talk about the transformation matrix. The transformation matrix consists of a combination of a scale, a rotation, and a translation. A library like GLM allows you to create a transformation matrix doing something similar to this. What I'm doing here is first creating a matrix that consists of how much we would like to scale the object in the x, y, and z dimensions. Next, I rotate the transformation by rotation degrees around the z axis. Finally, I translate the object to the position defined by position. An important thing to note is that the order of operations are very important here. For example, if we translate our object first, then rotate it, then scale it, the object will end up in a very different location. Typically, you want to scale the object first, then rotate, then translate, which does what we would intuitively expect of an object that had this transformation applied to it. Awesome, we have a transformation matrix, now we need a view matrix. The view matrix is very important for determining where your camera is located in the game world. So, for example, if we wanted to create a camera that's located at 0, 0, 020 in our game world, and it was looking towards 0, 0, 0, or the world origin, we could define a view matrix like this in GLM. If you're using another math library, the function names may be slightly different. You can see that I defined the eye, which is the camera's position in world space, the center, which is where the camera is pointed towards, 
and an up vector. The up vector is important because in order to orient ourselves in 3D space, we need to know which direction points up. For example, I could say point the camera to the center of the world, but if you don't know how I wanted it oriented, you could point it there an infinite number of ways. However, if I say point that camera at the center and make sure the global up vector is pointing towards the sky, then there's only one possible orientation for a camera. So we can give GLM these three vectors and it does some magic to give us a proper view matrix. We have two of our puzzle pieces, but the last piece we need is the projection matrix. This matrix is the most important matrix in terms of defining your world units. If we wanted to construct a projection matrix for a 2D game, we could use GLM's ortho function, which stands for orthographic projection. We could construct it by doing something like this. Okay, there's a lot of code here, but it's pretty trivial. I'm basically saying I want an orthographic projection matrix that spans 1920 units by whatever the proper aspect ratio's height would be. Aspect ratio is an important thing to consider, however I'm not going to go over it in detail. For now, you can just think of this as the scale factor to the height and world units of the camera's viewport. I then use these values to define the left and right of our camera viewport, the top and the bottom, and the near plane and the far plane. These values literally represent how far each of the camera's frustum planes will extend from the camera's position and orientation. What if you're coding a 3D game though? Well, you typically want to use a perspective matrix in that case, which takes the perspective of our scene into account. This basically means that objects that are farther away from the camera will look smaller, giving the scene a sense of depth. You can construct a perspective matrix in GLM doing something like this. We can simply give GLM the field of view of our camera, the window's aspect ratio, and the near plane and the far plane, and GLM will give us the appropriate projection matrix. Cool, we have these three matrices, now how do we transform our vertices sent to our vertex shader? Well, we can write a simple program for our vertex shader that looks like this. This code is written in a language called GLSL, Graphics Library Shading Language. This language is based on a C-style syntax, and it is the language used to write OpenGL shaders. Let's walk through this line by line and explore what's happening. The first line of this shader declares the version we're using. If you're familiar with C, C++, or C Sharp, then this should look familiar. This is a preprocessor directive that must appear as the very first line of the shader, excluding comments. This tells OpenGL which version this shader must be compatible with. You can find a list of versions of OpenGL and their corresponding shader versions in a link in the description. The last bit of that line tells us that we are using the core version of OpenGL, which basically just states that we will not use any functionality that has been considered deprecated. The alternative is compatibility, which tells OpenGL we may use deprecated functionality. The next line should be familiar if you watched the last episode. This is where we tell OpenGL that we expect a vertex attribute at location zero that will consist of three floating point numbers. Let's talk about how exactly this works though. First, we give a layout qualifier. The layout qualifier can be used to tell OpenGL several different things about that specific variable. Most of the time, you will use this qualifier to denote the location of the variable. This location is the same location that we use when setting up the vertex attributes on the CPU. But we can also let OpenGL automatically determine the location of the variable by not specifying it. We can also specify a location for any variable that we want. For example, we could specify that we want our uniform variable to be at location zero like this. But wait, I hear you asking, didn't we already use location zero for a vertex attribute? Won't this result in undefined behavior or a compilation error since we can't have two variables at the same location? Well, technically no. This is a good time to introduce the next section of variables, which all have another qualifier called uniform. Uniform is another special qualifier that you can use in GLSL. This qualifier tells OpenGL that this variable will be coming from the CPU. Then, on the CPU side, we can upload a variable of this type to the GPU using one of the many GL uniform functions. This means that the variable has a whole different set of locations that we can use. So, we can use the same location zero for this uniform and for a vertex attribute, and the variables will not reside in the same location in actual memory. So these next three lines of code simply tells the GPU to expect that we will have three mat4 or matrix4 variables coming from the CPU. Finally, we get to the main function, 
just like in C, we must declare a main function in all of our shaders. We do one big operation in our function, which is to set GL position to the combination of all our matrices. GL position is a special variable that is built into the language itself, and it's used by OpenGL to determine the final position of a vertex. There are a few other built-in GLSL variables that you can read about using a link in the description. Finally, we set the vertex position to the multiplication of our matrices. These multiplications work the same way they would in math, and just like how you can multiply matrices by appropriate sized vectors, you can do the same thing in GLSL. You'll notice one interesting thing I do at the end of the line, which is construct a VEC4 using a combination of a VEC3 and a float. This is a custom constructor for vectors in OpenGL. You can read more about the constructors in OpenGL in a link in the description. With custom constructors, you can compose a vector using a combination of other vectors and scalars. All these lines of code are equivalent in GLSL. You'll also notice that you can define integer vectors using an i as a prefix. There are other vector types available as well, such as an unsigned integer vector, or uvec, or boolean vectors, which are called bvex. You can read more about these in a link in the description as well. Another interesting feature that GLSL provides is something called vector swizzling. This is the process of extracting different components from a vector to form a different vector. As you can see, you can refer to a vector's individual components to create a brand new vector. You can refer to the individual components as X, Y, Z, and W for positions, or R, G, B, and A for colors, or S, T, P, and Q for texture coordinates but you cannot interchange these. So if you use X, Y, Z, or W, you can only use those values in that statement. You can think of this almost the same way you would think of a union and C. Awesome, we now have a brief understanding of how GLSL works and how we can construct a simple vertex shader, but this is only one half of the puzzle. If we refer back to the graphics pipeline, there's one more required stage by the programmer, and that's the fragment shader. Let's go over a brief fragment shader we can construct a very simple fragment shader that simply outputs the color red like this. It should look very similar to the vertex shader. There's one important thing to note. We define a vec4 output variable called frag color. OpenGL expects an output color from this fragment stage. So as long as we define one output, OpenGL will use that as the color. The rest of the shader should be pretty straightforward, so I won't belabor this. We'll talk about coding cool shaders in a few minutes. First, we need to talk about how we execute this code on the GPU. Well, if you're familiar with how a regular compiled language like C works, this should be fairly intuitive. We need to go through a few steps to compile and link our shaders together, similar to a C program. Compiling shaders is actually pretty simple. To compile a shader, we can do something like this in our C++ code. First, we create a shader object, the same way we created other objects in OpenGL. The only difference is the function we use, which is glCreateShader. We can specify the type of shader as several different things. You can find the documentation in the description. Next, we send the source code to the GPU. This function call just expects the shader ID we would like to send, the number of strings we will pass, which in most cases can just be one string, a pointer to the beginning of the array of strings, and a pointer to an array of string lengths, or null pointer if each string is terminated by a null byte. Finally, we compile the shader. This is pretty straightforward, but what about errors? We all know programmers never get anything right the first time, so we should code an expectation of that. Fortunately, OpenGL gives us a way to retrieve errors by doing this. As you can see, we use a couple of OpenGL functions to query for the status of the shader compilation. First, we ask for the compile status using glGetShaderIV, which takes the shader ID and a flag for what information we want and the address for the output. If the compilation of our shader failed, we can get the exact message from OpenGL. First, we ask OpenGL how long the string is that contains the message. Then, we allocate enough memory in our vector to contain the message, and we call a function, glGetShaderInfoLog, which will place the message into the memory location we provide. Finally, we make sure to delete the shader. If the compilation fails, there's no way we can use this shader and there's no sense keeping it in memory anymore. This is a good time to note that I'm using a custom library that I've developed. This library contains utilities for memory management and logging. So if you ever see a function that looks like g underscore some function, you can safely assume that this is just part of my library. The g stands for Gabe. Okay, 
so we can use all the steps I just described to compile our vertex shader and our fragment shader. I typically advise against early abstraction, but this code is super repetitive, so I would highly recommend abstracting this whole process into a structure or a class called shader and putting these methods into functions called compile or init. I would also recommend getting the source code of your shader from files, so you should use the file input output code that your programming language gives you to get the shader's text. This is useful so that you can actually store your shaders in separate files on your PC just like the rest of your code. Check out my code in the description for an example of how you could structure your source code files. Now we've compiled our shaders, but how does the GPU know that this vertex shader feeds directly into this fragment shader? Well, we can use a separate process called linking. This is not the same process of linking that a language like C and C++ uses, but it's conceptually similar, which is why the developers of the OpenGL specification call it this. We can link our two shaders together by doing something like this. First, we create the shader program object. This object is basically a combination of several different shaders that are all linked together. Next, we attach our vertex shader and our fragment shader from the previous steps to this program object. Finally, we link the programs together. Now, we have to be careful. Even if we compiled the vertex and the fragment shader successfully, we can still get errors from the linking process. We can ask OpenGL if any errors occurred in a similar way to how we checked for errors in the compilation process. This process is almost exactly the same as the compilation error checking. However, please notice that we use glgetprograminfolog and glgetprogramiv instead of glgetshaderinfolog and glgetshaderiv. If the process fails, I delete the program object and the shader objects. You don't necessarily need to delete the shader objects if you want to try to reuse them. However, it's probably a good idea to delete them unless you have some special code to handle this. Finally, if the linking process succeeded, it's a good idea to destroy the individual shaders like this. OpenGL has already compiled these shaders to an executable format and it doesn't need the source code anymore. So we can free up that memory on the GPU unless you want to reuse these shaders somewhere else. Now we can do some interesting stuff with this shader object. Once the shader is successfully compiled and linked, OpenGL can give us all sorts of information if we ask for it. For instance, remember how I said that we can assign locations to our uniform variables, or we can let OpenGL assign them automatically. Well, if we let OpenGL decide where they go, we still need to know their locations in order to upload those uniform variables to the GPU. So, we can programmatically retrieve that information and cache that information on the CPU. Here's an example of how you could retrieve all the active shader uniforms on the CPU. I'm not going to go over this example in a lot of depth because most of it is fairly straightforward programming. Think of this as fancy reflection in GLSL. First, I ask OpenGL how many active uniforms exist in this shader program. Once I know that, I can ask what the longest string length is for the uniform names. I allocate enough memory to hold the longest uniform name, then loop through the number of uniforms to retrieve information about them. As I loop through them, OpenGL will give me the uniform variable's name, its string length, and even the size and data type of the variable. We can then use this information to ask for the variable's location, which is either the programmer specified location, or the location that OpenGL automatically assigned to this uniform. I would recommend saving the variable location and name on the CPU, because we will use this information to upload values to the GPU. Real quickly, if you want to make sure that all these concepts are clicking for you, when you implement the challenges, print out the location and the name of all the active uniforms. Make sure you understand why they have the location that they do. Then, change some of the uniform locations and print them out again to really drive home what's happening. Alright, so now we can compile and link shaders, and then we can retrieve information about that shader program. What if we wanted to upload information to that shader? Well, we can use one of two methods. The first is to pass that information as a vertex attribute, which we did in the last episode. Unfortunately, this isn't good for data that's global per object. For instance, you may want to have a color for your game objects, but the color will be the same for every single vertex. It would be a waste of memory to repeat that color for every single vertex if it's just going to be the same. Fortunately, OpenGL gives us another way to upload information about objects. This second technique is to use a shader uniform. A shader uniform is data that you upload once per set of vertex data, then each vertex will receive that variable. 
There are more ways to upload information to shaders, such as shader storage buffer objects and textures, but those can be covered in a more advanced tutorial. How do we actually upload something to a uniform though? Well, we can use a function like this. This function will upload a for float structure to the variable at var location. Which shader will this upload it to though? Well, it will upload it to whichever shader is currently bound. So we could be more precise and write it like this. This will make sure that the shader program we want to use is currently bound and then upload the variable. There are several different functions that we can use to upload different types of variables. Check out the documentation at this link for all the possible functions and data types. If you save the variable locations like I suggested a minute ago, then you can simply query for that information on the CPU. This is another example where I would recommend abstracting the concept of a shader program into some structure or class called shader program. I would recommend a method that allows you to compile and link shaders into one big shader program and several functions to upload any uniform type to this shader program. You can save uniform variable locations in something like a hash map where you store the variable name as the key and the variable location as the index. That way you can do stuff like this and that will give you the location of the variable U projection matrix. There's one last important concept that we should talk about before we start talking about how shaders run in the grand scheme of things. This is passing data from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. Oftentimes you will want to pass things that you either generate or get somehow in the vertex shader to the fragment shader. Can we do this? Yes, and it's actually pretty simple. Say you have a vector and you would like to pass it to the fragment shader. You could do something like this in your vertex shader, and then in your fragment shader, do something like this. This will pass that variable through to the fragment shader. There are a couple of things to note here. The first is that the variable names must be the same. This can be avoided though, if you specify the layout location manually. So you could do this, and it's equivalent to what we did before, with the exception that we can change the variable name between shaders. Also, notice how we use the out and in qualifiers to denote that the vertex shader is passing that variable out to the fragment shader, and the fragment shader is consuming the variable in from the vertex shader. Also notice these variable locations have their own range. So you could have a uniform, a vertex attribute, and a global variable, which is what these are, that all use the location zero, and it's fine. Where do you define these variables in the grand scope of the whole shader though? Well, you define them at the outermost scope, which is why they are considered global, to the shader at least. Okay, one last thing I need to mention is that shader variables are automatically interpolated within the fragment shader. This means that if you send two different colors for two different vertices, the shader will interpolate the color between them depending on the distance. This interpolation will happen on a primitive basis. So if you have a triangle, the values will be interpolated based on the distance to all three vertices composing the triangle. If you have a line, the value will be interpolated based on the distance between the two points, etc. Sometimes you don't want to interpolate a value from the vertex shader to the fragment shader though. So you can specify the variable as flat, which lets GLSL know that it's not to be interpolated. You can do that like this. Now, remembering the order of qualifiers can be tricky. So check out this link in the description for the order that qualifiers are expected in. This tutorial is already becoming super long and we've barely scratched the surface of shaders. Using all the information we've gone over so far though, you should be able to create any vertex and fragment shaders that you can imagine. Let's go over a brief rundown of how to think about shaders conceptually, and then I'll give you several challenges to solidify these concepts. So we know what a shader is and how to compile and link several different types of shaders into one big shader program, but how does it execute? What does it output? How do we write good shaders? These are all complex questions that deserve entire episodes, if not series dedicated to each one. Let's answer them the best way possible for now. Vertex shaders operate on vertex data that was passed into the GPU from the CPU. Typically, you apply your transformations from world space to normalized device coordinates in the vertex shader. You can do more complex transformations in the vertex shader as well though. The fragment shader is where a lot more interesting stuff can happen. The best way to think about the fragment shader is that it runs the program once for every single pixel on the screen. Technically, it's running the program per fragment, but conceptually it's the same thing. Now, the catch is, the shader runs this program in all the pixels at the exact same time. 
This leads to an interesting way of thinking about things. Take, for instance, drawing a circle. Imagine you're on the beach, and I asked you to draw a circle in the sand. You would probably go about this by going to the location, x radius y zero, if we're being mathematically precise, and then proceed to drag your foot around the circumference of the circle. This is great, but it requires you to walk around the entire circumference of the circle just to draw it. What if instead, I gave you a board of LEDs with a bunch of switches to turn each LED on or off? Then I asked you, turn on these LEDs in the shape of a circle. What would you do? Well, you would go to each LED that lies within the bounds of the circle and then flip the switch on. Now, let's take this concept one step further and imagine that instead of manually flipping each LED switch, we write a program that turns them on or off. This program will run once for each LED and it knows its location within the whole board and what color it should be, but that's it. We could write a function that determines whether the LED is on or off by doing something like this. Now, if we run this function for every single LED at the same time and the center of the board is zero, zero, and each LED position ranges from negative one to one in the X and Y directions, then we can automatically determine whether the LED is inside the circle or outside of it. This is how a fragment shader works conceptually. There are several more concepts that you need to understand to write shaders well, and I'm not going to repeat concepts that have already been written about extensively by other people. Instead, your first challenge is to go through the Book of Shaders at thebookofshaders.com. This website has great code editor that allows you to edit your shaders and see the results immediately. It also gives you a massive amount of well thought out information on how to think about shaders. Most of my challenges will come directly from the challenges written about in the Book of Shaders. With that said, here are your challenges for today. One, read the Book of Shaders and learn how to think about shaders conceptually. Two, create a shader abstraction in your program. This abstraction should be able to one, compile a shader given the shader type, vertex or fragment, and the shader's file path, and two, destroy a shader that's been compiled by freeing the shader object in OpenGL. Three, create a shader program abstraction. This abstraction should be able to one, take two file paths, the vertex and the fragment shader, and compile and link the programs into one shader program object, two, bind the shader program object, three, unbind the shader program object, four, it should be able to destroy the shader object on the GPU, and then five, you should be able to upload a uniform variable of any data type to the shader object. Four, create a program that does the following. One, creates a square in local coordinates and uploads it to the GPU. Two, uploads the transformation, projection, and view matrix as uniform variables to transform this square from world space to screen space in the vertex shader. Three, Move this square around the screen by modifying the transformation matrix and uploading the result to the shader uniform variable. You should be able to move the square using the WASD keys on the keyboard. Five, create a program that does the following. One, creates a square in local coordinates and uploads it to the GPU. Two, places the square in the center of the screen using special transformation, view, and projection matrices. Three, uploads the same uniform variables that you use in the book of shaders tutorials. Four, it's able to run any of the programs you can create in the book of shaders. Six, once you have step five complete, finish the following challenges from the book of shader tutorials. One, draw several circles on one square that's in your game world using a fragment shader. Two, create a shader that mimics a Mondrian painting. Three, create a spinning color wheel similar to a max loading cursor. Okay, these next two challenges are above and beyond and you don't need to finish them, but they're here if you want them. Seven, create a vertex shader that uses the Perlin noise function in the Book of Shaders tutorial to modify a tessellated plane. To do this, you can do the following. One, create a set of 3D vertices that represent a flat plane on the CPU. Make it so that you can increase or decrease the tessellation very easily. You can do this by just creating a grid of squares. Two, upload these vertices to the GPU. Three, in the vertex shader, offset the height of these vertices using the fractal Brownian motion function from the Book of Shaders tutorial. Okay, and finally, this is the most challenging challenge, which you don't need to do. Eight, add lighting to your Perlin noise terrain. To do this, you can do the following. One, you can calculate the normal of any point on the terrain by doing the following calculation. A vertex normal equals normalize, 
VEC3 left height minus right height, 2.0 front height minus back height, where the left height, right height, front height, and back height are all obtained from calculating the values of the grid points to the left, right, front, and back of the current point. 2. Send these normals to the fragment shader. 3. Use an algorithm called Fong Shading to simulate a light source. You can find an extensive tutorial about this here. These challenges are not easy. They took me about a week to complete, or about 8 hours. Expect these challenges to take a significant amount of time. The last two challenges are not necessary, but if you find yourself with some extra time while you're waiting for me to release the next episode, feel free to challenge yourself. As always, if you get stuck on any of the challenges, you can check out my code using the link in the description. If you would like to have your solution displayed in the description, reach out to me in the Discord channel. And if I forget to upload it, keep reminding me until I remember. Thank you for watching. If you like this, please consider liking the video and subscribing. And I'll see you guys in the next episode, where we will be talking about textures, texture packing, and dynamic UVs.